Mons Jensen is an adventurer, a professional mountaineer, a former triathlete for the Danish national team, and a school teacher. He's also asthmatic. Mons is a person who loves to challenge himself to the limit of his potential. After being diagnosed with asthma, Mons refused to become a victim of his chronic disease. Instead, he wanted to set an example and inspire others, and the human potential does not have any boundaries. In 2004, Mons bicycled and ran from Denmark to Mount Everest Base Camp, a strenuous trip through 13 countries which he covered in 100 days. No other person in the world has achieved this before. Now, Mons inspires people and leaders to fulfill their potential. Every once in a while, we meet a person that you can connect with and they are like kindred spirits, somebody who is equally mad as I am. And uh, this week, we were uh, presenting together at uh, TEDx in Dubai and I saw him and he started with, I am crazy <laughs> and I'm saying, I am mad and he's crazy. And this was the most wonderful start. Uh, Mons Jensen is here all the way from Denmark uh, he now lives in Dubai and basically he has done some of the most amazing, amazing things. And he's here to talk to us about his insights, his experiences, but most importantly about how he's making a difference and how he's just changing the world and how he connects with you. And uh, so today, uh, Mons, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank it's you very much indeed. Thank, Thank you. you for Thank you. inviting me. It, it was just such an inspiration uh, a few days ago. Uh, and likewise, <laughs> yeah, very... like you said, it's for me also to, to meet kindred spirits, yeah. you can feel, you know, you know I have goosebumps. I, the, I, when you're saying that, I'm yeah. actually getting exactly because that, yeah. The, yeah. You know, you're mad and I'm crazy, yeah, but it, it all boils up to, you know, just the same uh, idea that uh, we're really passionate about things and, and we are sticking out yeah. and, and pursuing our own path yeah. in life uh, and being uh, as authentic as we can. I'm glad you use the word authentic because that's my core word, that as long as you can create that authenticity inside you, everything can flow from there. People can smell BS a mile away these days oh, because you have so much knowledge. And, and luckily for that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. luckily for that, yeah. uh, it's uh, very important. To, to be able to do that. Some people also say that you're lucky to, to find passions in life. Yes. And I think that's correct because I've known people who, who've been searching more or less their entire life and mm -hmm. they haven't found it. So yeah. in that way, it's, you know, when, when you have it, um, then one of the challenges in my book is that you have to continue being grateful for that thing mm -hmm. and it's not taking it for granted. Yeah. But that in itself is a, is a, is a challenge because it, it's so normal for you. But, uh, but it really is, um, it's a great gift and it's, it's also, I think, the way when you, when you have your passion, mm -hmm. uh, you can ignite the energy that yeah. uh, everybody needs, uh, you know, 97% of the way towards a goal or a dream, yeah. it's hard work. Yeah. And the more you see it as, as a passion and a mission as opposed to going to work, I, mm -hmm. when I do motivational speaking, I, I often provoke uh, the audience saying, what do you do on, well, in Dubai it will be Sunday morning, do you go to work? <laughs> Or do you go on a mission? Yes. And the difference is passion. Right. Uh, and it's also motivation, you know, yeah. external motivation, you know, the things that you have to do, yeah. maybe, uh, and also people will like you to do. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people are pursuing goals that are actually goals of their parents, unfulfilled dreams from parents led yeah. on to children. Yeah. Um, and that can give you, a, it can take you a long way. But mm -hmm. in the end, you have to look at what's, what's my internal motivation. Yes. What is it? In life that I can't help not doing. Mm -hmm. if, if you can find that, then you're you're really really lucky, and then you just have to cherish it and be uh, grateful, uh, because that's when you can find the really 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 big resources, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, now I, I am a mountaineer of uh, of a rig, and I've, I can't get any higher in this world. So I'll give you a good example. When you're standing at eight thousand five hundred meters on Everest. Um, and you don't have anything but your own lungs without oxygen. You haven't slept for four days and you're so tired you don't really care whether you live or die. Um, there's going to be a little devil in the back of your head uh, asking you what on earth are you doing here. <laughs> yes. And that's understandable. Yeah. But the thing is, if, if, if when the question is asked and you can't, from your mental backpack, find the big why, yeah. you're going to turn around. So yeah. that's the thing. And the big why wouldn't come from external motivation. The big why would come from deep inside what's yeah. in it for you. Yeah. And so, so that's the necessity. You have to find the internal motivation. And that's where the passion lies. Yeah. 
Let's go on that journey because where did it all start as a, as a child? I mean, were you were you naughty? Were you crazy? Are there any moments there that you remember? Uh, well, uh, you should ask someone else, <laughs> but, but sure. I, 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 um, I probably always uh, was rather independent and follow my own uh, uh, paths. Mm. Um, circumstances in life also made that. Uh, that uh, my sister and I, we, we were, you know, um, yeah, we had to take a little bit more care of ourselves um, due to some illness in the family. And, and that probably gives you a, a little bit more um, leeway to, to discover yourself. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'd say the big jump for me came at the age of 18. Uh, that was my, uh, that was kind of a, uh, if not a U-turn, then a, a turn. Because I met some people that inspired me really well uh, into pursuing uh, my own dreams and uh, also, to be honest, towards what both my heart and my head uh, was was telling me. Um, but the world was, uh, I used to play uh, football and uh, and table tennis, which isn't uh, that flamboyant. But then there was uh, some sort of, uh, at that point we are talking very early 90s, uh, I saw on television there was a sport called triathlon. Yes. Which is swimming, uh, cycling and running. Yeah. And, and to me, I heard about someone had done an Ironman and I was able to run two kilometers at that time. That's 1.4 miles, uh, the maximum. And, and someone, a human being to be able to do a complete Ironman, 3.8 kilometers of swimming and 180 kilometers of cycling and then a marathon, 42 kilometers in one day. I thought that, that you know, for me, that was impossible. But then, you know, something draw me, uh, drew me towards that because I was mainly fascinated by the, the mental process, uh, the journey of, of wonder and curiosity. Those have been my big drivers, what, what's possible, what are the capacities of uh, the human uh, spirit and soul and then the body follows. Um, so, so triathlon was a door opener for me and I started out you know, running three kilometers mm -hmm. and well in the matter of three years um, I went from, from that to, to doing the Ironman and uh, I think within, yeah it was about three years. I actually, at the age of 21, finished second at my national championship mm -hmm. and was on the national team. Um, so that was from, I couldn't swim when I started. I was afraid of swimming because I drowned. And then uh, three years later, I was on the national team. And at that time, you may have been hard pressed to find five people at the age of 21 who had gone beyond, uh, below uh, nine hours on an Ironman, but I was one of them. And I never saw it coming, but my, my point is, um, one thing is when, when you pursue things, you, normally you'd say that you have the belief it's possible or you have the belief that it's impossible. Mm -hmm. I also think you can sometimes pursue things uh, just with an open mind saying, I don't really know because I've never gone there before, but I'm going to give everything I have and I will see what happens. So it's more like a neutral thing as opposed to being the positive or negative. And I think that sometimes, uh, at least it's helped me and I think it can help because it can be a big pressure just believing that it, it can be done. Sometimes you just need to have a, the open mind and then go with the flow. Exploration is one thing, and, and but visioning is the other. I mean, I think... Uh, and, and that's the next step, because I did triathlons for many years. Uh, I think since I was a little kid, when I remember, I always had the fascination of mountains. Mm -hmm. Whenever I saw an atlas or a globe, I, I had to find <laughs> yes, Everest. Yes. A lot of yeah, uh, yeah. children do that, but uh, I guess... Um, being crazy as I did, I acted on it. But the thing is, uh, at the age of 26, I was diagnosed with uh, asthma. Mm -hmm. uh, I was training at 30 to 40 hours per week. Yeah. Uh, so you understand that feeling tired would be uh, you know, part of the job. But I often had the, the feeling that I was uh, breathing through a straw. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I guess someone probably uh, asked me, do you think it could be asthma? In the end, I called my doctor and had some tests. And they do two tests. One is to see the volume of your engine. Yes. And he was just, you know, looking at me like, oh, you're just a wiener because you have the <laughs> engine the size of, you know, a very big Ferrari. But but it doesn't really matter if the engine doesn't work. So mm -hmm. the second test, I had a 60% utility off my engine. So he said, oh, that we got you. So, so I was diagnosed with asthma. And, and at that point, you know, it's, it's a two-edged sword because on the one point it was a relief. Mm -hmm. I wasn't just being a chicken with no spine who couldn't handle pain. Yeah. It was actually something real. And then on the other hand, I had to realize that I've just been diagnosed with an illness that will probably follow me for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I think it's the same as a situation. Uh, but when, when, you, when you get that, you have two options. You have a, option one, 
you let your illness control you and you just sit back uh, and feel sorry for yourself for the rest of your life mm-hmm. and you won't help you very much. Mm-hmm. And the biggest uh, activity will be playing bridge. Yeah. Not that I have anything <laughs> about, against bridge. But, my, but, my father used to play bridge, so yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. I, I once did a, a motivational speak at a at a, a large school in Denmark and yeah. I used that you know with a yeah. blink in my eye but then the day after one of the teachers came in and she said that she was actually a bit sad that I had used that metaphor because she was on the national team <laughs> playing bridge <laughs> yes. so fair enough <laughs> I could only excuse but but then you have the second option and that is you say um, no way mm. I will not be limited in my dreaming and my thinking I'm going to con- take control of my illness yeah and then I will learn everything there is to learn about my illness. I will take responsibility of my own also, instead of just letting, you know, the, the health system uh, help me uh, as the only thing. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a, you know, entire wall of the internet where you can get a lot of information. And, and, and that's, the, that's the path I chose. And being a teacher of a written that I am, um, I also, uh, as time went by, saw other asthmatics, and especially asthmatic children. And I saw that a lot of them were being limited in their thinking, in their perception of the world, uh, not only by themselves, but also the world around them. The, it's society, like the parents yeah. were putting cotton around them. You know, they would they would be excused from doing sports uh, because that would be dangerous in their opinion. But that's the worst thing you can do for an asthmatic. They have to do more exercise. They just have to warm up a little bit more. So so and and if you look at the science and all the research, eighty percent of asthmatics are not properly medicated Mm -hmm. as to what they can be. Uh, We know with the knowledge we have today that you can, 99% of the, uh, you know, year you can have a more or less symptom-free life. And and through that, you can can, uh, pursue your dreams and your goals uh, just as big as if you didn't have an asthma. So I thought, you know, um, something needs to be done about that. Something needs, uh, a story needs to be told that you shouldn't just be... uh, stuck up with limited thinking. And, and at that point, I was getting tired of doing triathlon. So I thought the, the mountains were sneaking <laughs> in of me. I, I needed, I always knew I needed, you know, a higher level of, of challenge. Right. Doing an Ironman, if you have a bad day, you can just uh, drop out and call a taxi. Right. So I needed something where you would dress yourself. Uh, well, it was like my, uh, the biggest challenge I, I had um, in my head that I wanted to give myself, uh, the ultimate challenge where I dressed myself completely naked and started from scratch and then built towards, uh, and that we talk about, it, it became Everest. But something inside you, I mean, what you're sharing is, is, is amazing, but what was that, the ignition? What, what ignited you? Because uh, well, I would you, you... say that if it was different things. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my friends gave me a book at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a Swede called Juran Krop, who uh, in 96 had cycled from Stockholm in Sweden. Uh, down to Everest Base Camp and had climbed Everest uh, without oxygen. And, and uh, all of a sudden, when, when I saw that, I had, th- I had thought about you know, climbing Everest. I had never thought about transporting myself from my own country to Base Camp. But, but after reading that book, it's kind of materialized there. Mm-hmm. This is my big mission. And, and when we're talking about the big mission, it's like before you have, first and foremost, your internal motivation being, what's in it for me? Mm-hmm. And, and it was, again, uh, of course, when you want to climb Everest, you have a big ego too. Of, yeah. You need that, otherwise you're going to get yourself killed. But but curiosity and wonder. And then, of course, maybe it's in the genes when, when you're a, a teacher, then the altruistic part of you wanting to do good for other people. Yeah. Uh, and I was very much inspired also by Gandhi, who said, be the change you want to see in the world. Yeah. Uh, make a difference. Yeah. Uh, so when you actually went out on this journey, uh, in the back of your mind, was that why really strong for you or was it more? It was, yeah. yeah, no, 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 it was ex- exceptionally strong. Also because I, I had, I had uh, nurtured it for a long time. Yeah. But it, yeah, it, it became strong. But I would tell you one thing, uh, when, when it's like a mountain, you know, the internal motivation is the, the really strong point. But when, when something that's egotistical in, in the beginning, uh, all of a sudden starts to make sense for other people and you can start inspiring other people then you have the other side of the mountain and in the end when that's the synergies that create the summit mm-hmm. and that's what I saw uh, especially also going on the journey that when you can combine these two forms of motivation then mm-hmm. the strength you can find when you're under pressure and yeah. adversity hits you with 200 kilometers per hour sure. um, that, that creates the biggest why at least for me and, uh, so what I, the way I'm seeing this is, uh, if you can do this, 
this is your life, you did your triathlons, and then you wanted to climb Mount Everest, and then you don't want to do that. It looks like a heartbeat, yeah, actually. Yeah, it does. Well, it is true. It is the sinus curve. Yeah. Um, um, you're completely, completely right. The thing is, when you're, it's a good example, when, when you're summiting Everest, um, you're only halfway. Yeah. Goes to show. You can't have a helicopter pick you up. There's no elevator built in, in the mountain. <laughs> yes. And you could say that the way down is the rest of your life. Um, mm. But also you can say that 90% of all accidents happen on the way down. But yeah. it's, it's fair enough. But the thing is, uh, if, if you climb Everest and, and that's it, you just put it in the bag, yeah. don't use it anymore, then it becomes more or less useless. Yeah. So the thing is, what are you going to use it for? And, and if you look at me, then I'm a, I'm a father now. I have, uh, have a son who's called, well, oddly enough, he's called Storm. Okay, and, uh, <laughs> it's oddly. I, I think <laughs> most people respect the Storm. <laughs> yeah. And I have Sophia, and they're two and five. So, yeah. so that's a... So I'm fantastic. surprised you didn't call them Peak and Summit. Yeah, yeah, but uh, Storm still relates. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was my idea, and my wife got to choose uh, Sophia's name. So fair enough. Okay. But the thing is, yeah, paying it forward is yeah. the one thing that makes it most... Uh, the millions of people will be watching this interview, a lot of them are looking for jobs. A lot, a lot of them are, are actually stuck in their lives, and they just want to unlock something. So imagine that they are here and, and looking a little bit sad, and then in the in front of them they see life, and this is life. Sure. What do you what do you tell them? Because I mean, the guys here can't find a job, or saying, well, this this region needs fifty million jobs. What do you do from there to there? And how do you? Well, go- the thing is, uh, first of all, you need to be uh, aware that the best way to climb a mountain is to take one step at a time. Yeah. So you have to look at what's the nearest zone of development for me. Mm-hmm. Um, look at yourself and look at your strengths. Um, yeah. I believe I, I'm also a student of, of positive psychology and positive psychology has a very um, direct focus of, towards strength yeah. because strengths are uh, well you may as well use your your biggest strengths but the, the thing is 80% of all people are not aware of their signature strengths mm-hmm. so they should you can do a simple test at a uh, biocharacter.org mm-hmm. uh, it's a self-assessment test of your strengths uh, one of my strengths would be zest, that's life energy. Yes. Uh, another one would be uh, perspective. Mm-hmm. And the next one would be debatable is humor. You know, some people think <laughs> yes. I don't have any humor. <laughs> but no, but things like that. Um, so that would be a good thing. Uh, do a self-assessment of what are my signature strengths because I believe that when you, when you use them, mm-hmm. that's where the passion also uh, will be found. So and the thing is, the next one is, um, as also what I do is uh, I do health interventions and mm-hmm. health physically, mentally, and socially. Mm-hmm. But especially health in, in general, if you're looking at the, the challenges of the world, mm-hmm. then that maybe that should be... Um, I believe that must, if you have a strong body, you'll have a strong mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they go together. Positive psychology says that half of positive psychology is from the neck down. Mm-hmm. So that will be one thing that you can optimize uh, rather quickly. Look at, look at your sleeping. That will be one of the key factors. I don't I, sleep very well, but no, maybe you can guide me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you sleep yourself uh, yeah. into success because yeah. um, when you sleep, then your brain processes yeah. what happened. So yeah. it's mm-hmm. not allowed to process. There will be a lot of waste. Um, so you need to sleep probably. If uh, some people can't, and yeah. that's fair enough. It's no, that's only now. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is, uh, it's it's a very overlooked uh, topic. Sleep. So, mm-hmm. so make sure you do that, and uh, you're eating, and you're training. And it doesn't. You have to. You don't have to train yourself to be able to climb Everest. You yeah. just have to to look at uh, where am I now and how do I get my next percentage. Because it's also about uh, what signals are you sending mm-hmm. towards the people you go uh, for an interview with. Yeah. If, if, if you're not uh, you know, exuding uh, healthy yeah. living, then I think you're giving yourself a lesser chance and, and that's a controllable. Yeah. Uh, you have a lot of things when you're out of work yeah. that will be uncontrollable. Yeah. But first of all, look at the things you can control and when you've optimized those, it'll give you a better in my book, uh, chance uh, meeting the uncontrollables. Yeah. Um, so let's stay with this metaphor. This person takes the first step and just using the whole philosophy of mountain climbing, especially when you go up, you go up and then you take a few steps down and sure. then you go up and then you take... This is how you normally climb, yeah. uh, as I understand it. I'm it not is. a mountaineer. No, you, you must have been a mountaineer. <laughs> no, no, no I, was, I read a lot. Uh, sure. But the whole idea of going up and coming down, going up and coming down, yeah. I think this is a great metaphor for life. Is this, It's not just that you, uh, as the master Iron Man, you know, Mons Jensen, going all the way up. and then. Oh, exactly. uh, so what, what is I the core message that are you giving um, them? 
What you what you are addressing is one of my uh, big passionate topics. It's called resilience. Uh, I summited Everest not in my first, not in my second, but in my third attempt. It took me five years to get there, and I was uh, blessed with 40 minutes on the summit. So five years, 40 minutes. It just also goes to show that you have to focus uh, on the journey, and uh, that's where the learning will be. And um, we all have ups and downs, and, and, and that's part of life. Uh, I think one of the big obstacles of, of uh, acknowledging also that adversity has a lot of reason and, and meaning for us. We should, we should pursue it in, in, in many ways, uh, because that's where no one reaches a big goal without adversity. So you should, you should remember when you're feeling that, that you're really challenged in life and, and you're trying for something and you don't succeed, some, the easiest thing is to say, I'm the only one in the world who's experiencing this. Mm. Uh, remember, it happens for everybody. Mm. Everybody in this world experiences the sinus curve. And you've, you've, uh, you've done it here. You know, the sinus curve is keeping us alive. Yeah. And, and I, I use it as a metaphor. You know, you should acknowledge that the bumps are part of the way. Yeah. And just remember, when you go to the hospital and they do a, an EKG on it, the nurse will tell you, Moons, it's a good thing that the, it goes like this, because if it's a straight line, then yeah. you have a problem. You need yeah. to pull the red straight, it means you're dead. Yeah. You know, we, we need those things. If you never experienced adversity, how were you able to cherish uh, when things went well? Yeah. They, you know, they, they depend upon each other. So one of the things that happened was, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but one of the things that happened, you almost reached the summit the first time, yeah. and then you had to return. What was that like? Because a lot of us in our lives almost get a job or almost get a contract or almost get something that we really, really want sure. and then we lose it. Yeah. What was your emotion at that point in well, time and how did you recharge yourself? First of all, I was very tired. <laughs> but but it, it was, uh, it was, uh, in, in many ways, it was um, an easy choice but a, an extremely painful choice because mm -hmm. it was something I had visual, visualized back home. Mm -hmm. When you're at 8,500 meters, you have one third of oxygen, so you're not rational. You have to have uh, prepared for what oh, do I do when it happens, and then you execute the strategy. Right. So that's the thing. Same thing when you go for a job interview. Try and visualize all the things that can happen, and, and then you can ex execute strategies mm -hmm. because I think doing a job interview is the same thing as being high on a mountain. You're hypoxic. You don't think clearly. <laughs> you're under very much of pressure, so you need to have prepared properly. Yeah, uh, and, and and that's the thing you can do. You, you know, how do I? Well, first of all, you have to accept it's part of the game. Mm -hmm. What I was trying to do was uh, jumping through a, well an invisible hole because no one, no asthmatic had summited Everest without oxygen before. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to do something that hadn't been done. Yeah, and and I knew that just for people trying to do Everest without those not having asthma, uh, some people had tried seven eight times before that. So I also think that. Whatever line of business you're in, in life, um, know the history. You have to pay respect, pay homage to the past because you can learn from the past. Mm -hmm. and, and I knew that. So it's easier to accept when you know it's part of the game. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you come back home and, and, and you recuperate, you start looking at the why again. Is the why big enough for you to go back home and train for 30, 40 mm -hmm. hours per week for another year and come back? And, and uh, through that process, I found out it was. And then, of course, having the big ego and the big ambition also helps because they also, uh, they propel you forward. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the thing was, uh, accept what happened. And then, you know, from, from crisis, there are two elements being, um, you know, being in a crisis and then coming out on the other side strengthened. Um, that's also re resilience yeah. is if you define that it's an unexpected outcome right. so that means uh, two things are very important the first thing is that when you have the crisis your emotions have to be you have to be able to um, embody the entire scope of emotions mm -hmm. both the negatives and the positives you have to be able to think positively also although no matter how black it, it, it seems. That's the one thing. You have to have the entire range of emotions and be able to, uh, to um, have that in you. And then the second thing is maybe the most important for human beings. It's called relations. Mm -hmm. You have to share the journey with at least one person. Uh, otherwise, you will uh, end up being uh, weakened by your crisis. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing you have to... On your journey, no one climbs a mountain on their own. And it's the same thing here uh, uh, for the people who, if they're looking for a job. 
uh, have some th- someone help you. Yeah. Uh, ask for their advice. Find inspiration. You're not the first person in the world who's in this situation. Yeah. What did people who were there before you and succeeded, what did they do? What were their unique habits? How can you learn from them? Put that into context and maybe it'll give you half a percent and you may think it's not enough, but maybe that half percent is what will make you stand out tomorrow at the job interview as opposed to the other people coming. Yeah. What you just mentioned was very close to my heart, uh, Mons, because uh, <clears throat> I, have decided, I did my peak in my career as a, as a businessman, as a professional and so on. And now I'm sort of here, then going back up again um, in terms of as an entrepreneur and somebody who wants to go out there and make a social difference. And what you just said to me, it, it connected a lot with me, resonated a lot. And that is that it's difficult to do it on your own. Yes. And uh, so I need a co-founder, I think, and all the 25 million people watching there, I need a co-founder. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, it, it's on a, on a very serious note, it, it, it's, a very, it's a very lonely journey. Did, were you lonely in your journey? Um, yes, at, at times, uh, loneliness uh, surely yeah. is there. Yeah. Um, especially when, you, when you're up high on the mountain, yeah. you, you are left with uh, yourself and your own uh, ability to make the right choices at the right time right. but still you're also a part of the team and no no man climbs a mountain on his own it just as, as you near the summit then mm. you also become more and more dependent uh, on yourself and you have to be very very honest towards yourself mm. uh, am i doing the right thing do i have the power to go on um, and when i do have that do i also have the power to go down yeah um, so so yeah loneliness i think is a, is a part of it um, but, but it shouldn't be the only one. It, it'll be flashes of loneliness and then you have um, the group that you can... Um, when you go from one camp to another, then you have to be more alert on yourself and you reach the next camp and you yeah. fall. Someone carried a tent, someone carried a stove, someone carried the food, someone has the sleeping bags. It's all creating you know, the synergies that is the expedition. And uh, the reason why that's happening because eight people with big egos, you know, they can be, you would say they go their own way. Mm-hmm. But we are on a joint mission and that means that the ego stays uh, put for, for most of the time and then we see these are my strengths, how can we use them yeah. for us to have the, you know, the ultimate goal reached. At the end of the day, I mean, ego is, is fine because it energizes you, but I think uh, there's enough glory in the world and then there's enough to do in the world to be able to share and still I think thrive. One of my experiences is that to, to pursue the big goals, you need your ego. But to, uh, to come home from them, mm-hmm. you need humility. humility. Yeah. yeah. Only the, the brave uh, will, will try to climb Everest and only the humble will return. Mm-hmm. Because you're entering something, uh, you're, you're paying visit to something that is much bigger than yourself. Mm-hmm. And in this uh, history, it's, it's nature. Yeah. And if you're not humble, um, nature will teach you a lesson. Maybe you're lucky to survive it, but it'll have a price that uh, yeah. will cost you dearly. And on the other hand, maybe you'll be, you know, one of the statistics who never came home. I'm not saying that everybody who mm-hmm. didn't come home wasn't humble, but but the thing is, you have to be humble. And I believe that it's because the journey we're on is uh, we don't have a finish line we're working mm-hmm. towards. Yeah. It, it's, and humanity doesn't. We don't have a finish line. It's a, it's an ongoing process. And what we're looking at. As human beings, I think it's called marginal gains. We also we're always looking for how can we become a little more um, developed in, in our mental or physical or social strengths, uh, and and that's the thing. That's the one of the abilities we have as human beings. We yeah. can we can learn from our experiences. Um, so so that and that's the thing is you have to be humble and grateful of the gifts you've been given, and. Uh, being humble also knows that you, you're never finished. You can always build on what you have. Mm-hmm. And if, if you think you've finished, then you're not humble anymore. Mm-hmm. And, and I think you've done a big mistake. So, so that's one of the things I try to, um, to, to give, uh, pay forward to the people I work with, but also use it uh, for myself and, and my family. Let me take you back to your craziness. I mean, apart from climbing uh, Mount Everest, uh, you let's say Denmark is here, and then you wanted to run you wanted to yeah, yeah. you wanted to bike all the way. I mean, what possesses a person to try and do something completely crazy like that? Yeah, it was crazy, and it was um, out of curiosity, uh, very much out of wonder, and of course ambition. I, I wanted to give myself the ultimate um, 
goal that I, you know, my fantasy could give. And uh, the thing is, when I started this and I was on the front page of my home local newspaper, the only thing I had climbed was uh, the Sky Mountain of Denmark. <laughs> and it sounds like it's a high mountain, but it's 160 meters uh, above sea level. So, so the thing was for me to start from scratch. Yeah. Believing myself, uh, as, as at that time I had, I had been shown, I had a reasonable ability to learn quickly. Mm -hmm. um, in two and a half years, I wanted to go from the Sky Mountain uh, and then finish off. Of course, I had a preparation phase where I would uh, you know, be learning about um, what is it to be a mountaineer, and I went on different expeditions. Um, I was lucky enough to, uh, to, to get some sponsors that you know, created a platform that I could be a professional mm -hmm. climber in the country without mountains. Uh, so it allowed me to, to have a, a very intense process where I could learn and, and then finish it off. But it was like, you know, the ultimate challenge. It was very romantic in, in many ways also. Uh, but, but I thought that, you know, that would be a, a fantastic platform of learning. Mm -hmm. uh, learning what I can and also what I, what I can't at the moment, you know, mm -hmm. to find out where my boundaries are. And, and when I see them, how do I, how do I uh, push them a little bit? Yeah. Tell us how you spend your time these days. What these are the, days, what having, are the sort of things doing? Having done all these uh, crazy things, yes. uh, I still do crazy things, but with a different uh, perspective. Yeah. Because now I have that story, and I've become a father. You have another responsibility, mm -hmm. and, and you take the gas off all the the big risks. At least I, mm -hmm. I've done mm -hmm. uh, eighty percent at least, yeah. um, because my parent, my children didn't ask to to come here. Though. Yeah. Was, you brought them. <laughs> yeah, we, we brought them, my yeah. wife and I. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so, so I tried to, I've, when, I, when I was at that crossroad, I, I looked back and said, what have I learned? What are my fantastic um, victories? Mm -hmm. And maybe even more important, what are my fantastic failures? Mm -hmm. Because I believe you learn much more from your failures than your successes. Mm -hmm. And that's where you really have to have open eyes and be very humble and see, how can I take... Uh, that on. So paying it forward uh, means that I, I, nowadays I, I do motivational speaking, mm -hmm. I do business development and then I found a niche in Denmark. I created a, a concept for the very business, uh, very busy businessman. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be like um, I found a niche of the top 1% of society in Denmark. So mm -hmm. I've uh, had the pleasure of working with the Minister of Justice, members of European Parliament, mayors of some of the biggest cities of Denmark, company owners, very successful people in many ways who are incredibly inspiring. So I've learned uh, more from them than they have from me. But then one, the price they all paid pursuing their dreams was they forgot about themselves. And that's why I came into the picture. So I've had a lot of these uh, people who were standing uh, more or less with one leg mm -hmm. or one and a half leg in the grave. And within three months, uh, I've uh, transformed them into, you know, they've become 20 years younger, both uh, physically and mentally. And, right. and uh, I give them the platform so they can carry out all their dreams. And, and that, um, of course, I, I use my experiences. So is that a physical process? An it's exercise? a very much yeah. mental process okay. uh, because the physical is so easy. Anyone yeah. can tell a person how to swing a kettlebell. That's yeah. the easy part. Yeah. What is my main uh, focus is, is uh, psychology because mm -hmm. that's where it all happens, and mm -hmm. that's what I, that's what I'm good at. I, I'm I'm born with probably what would be a little more mirror neurons than the average, meaning that my empathy, my ability to understand and find people mm -hmm. uh, where they are. We have a very famous uh, philosopher in Denmark. He's dead, for so Son Kierkegaard, and he once said, "If you want to take someone somewhere, mm -hmm. it's a very good idea to find them where they are." And I think that is the epicenter of uh, helping other people, is finding them where they are, understanding them, and then you can carry on the journey. So, so that, uh, I, I, in the past five years, I've had around 100 clients, and it's at least four months, very intense uh, processes, mm -hmm. and uh, it's been so inspiring and, and learning uh, for me, uh, and hopefully also for them. Yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. Now, you reached one peak, you are a father, that's uh, the biggest one. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, sure. uh, as a father, as a parent, and a lot of parents would be watching something like this. Now, you, what's your next peak, Nons? Where are you going? Yeah. I understand the lower risk, yeah, but, sure. but you've got a big heart, yeah. you've got a big vision, you've got a lot of energy and experience. Um, what's the next peak? The next peak for me is, uh, you could call it hopes uh, for... Well, first of all, of course, asthma is one of my babies. Yeah. Um, and especially coming to, to Dubai in the Middle East, it's, it's, 
it's a, it's a rather big uh, mm. issue and it's a big challenge. In Dubai alone, more than 10% of the population uh, are asthmatic. If you look, go to Saudi Arabia, it's one in four. That means 25%. Mm. And if you say that 25% of population has allergy or asthma, mm. and 80% of those people are not properly um, medicated mm. and, and, and trained, uh, so it, it will be rising the well-being of... Uh, of people and, and asthma, uh, asthmatics, of course, but also just um, to be able to help other people who have their dreams, mm -hmm. who want to pursue their own Everest. And, and we have to remember that uh, an adventure is a subjective uh, uh, matter. Yes. Uh, it can mean, it doesn't matter what you do, as long as you do it with passion and, and you know you pursue your own Everest, meaning that you have some dr dreams and goals, uh, both for yourself and also hopefully for people around you. Um, to, to be able to, to help those people, mm -hmm. uh, giving them um, mentoring and, and coaching so that like, hopefully they can, you know, in that journey, maybe they can learn from me and not do the same mistakes that I did uh, and do some other mistakes. <laughs> yes. And also, yeah, yeah just a general thing. And also just, the, especially health-wise, yeah. we have to realize that uh, right now, in, in my opinion, if you look at the world and we look at human beings, we have a very big mismatch. Uh, REM uh, said that what we once wrote, uh, I think it was on the album document, what we need and what we want has been confused. Mm -hmm. We have to remember that we are creatures of nature. Uh, we are not made for sitting on a chair looking into a computer screen for 10 hours per day. We need to go out into nature. There's a reason why we call this body a motion apparatus. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, uh, it's not made for sitting still in inactivity. Yeah. Um, th and that's the worst part, isn't it? For a human being, the easiest thing to do in any aspect of life is not do anything. Then if, if you want to feel bad, it's easy. Don't do anything. It'll come by itself. Yes. And, and that's the same thing if you look at a relationship. Mm -hmm. If you want your relationship to be bad, easier recipe. Don't do anything. It'll yeah. come by itself. So anything and health especially, health never rests. That means no matter how successful you become, you cannot buy a ticket that would give you eternal health. It's an active, and no matter how much money you make, you can't buy good health. It's you have to be active towards it, so, and and that for me is uh, we have to go back to where we came from, where we realized that body and mind, it's uh, heart and and, uh, and head, it, it's connected. And uh, I think there's a mismatch right now. Where we're forgetting that. So we need to go back to be able to move forward. So while you're working towards uh, eliminating or in inspiring people to uh, engage and, and deal with asthma, uh, which is one big thing, I, while you were talking, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, there's a collateral benefit here because you've got to be fitter. When you're fitter and stronger, you're in this country. Half the country, half the young people in this country are diabetic. Type 2 yes. diabetes is going to be more than 50%. And, and, and that's, oh, so that's, that's a collateral benefit. Oh, it is collateral. And diabetes, being a health mentor, yeah. uh, if I look at all the clients that I had with diabetes too, mm -hmm. um, the, the one who was able to throw away his diabetes medicine, uh, the latest was uh, three months. Mm -hmm. And the only pill he took to get rid of that medicine was the pill called the lifestyle pill. He started focusing on his sleep, <laughs> his uh, diet, and his training. And then it went away. Whereas often we see nowadays, if people are diagnosed with something, the first question they ask the doctor is, what can I get for it? <laughs> Instead of what can I do about it? Yeah. Because diabetes too, as long as you haven't had it for, if you had it less than five years, you know, looking at your lifestyle, I'm not saying that it can happen to anybody because it can't, but a lot of people would be able to go a very, very long way focusing on the basics. Get mm -hmm. enough sleep, eat, and, uh, and move your butt. You're a man who brings about hope. Uh, this is a ball of hope, which was done by uh, one of my friends, Bobby Sager in Africa, where little kids were given this That's ball to play. Story. It's a great story. Uh, how do you give hope? To people what are you doing in your life because you have the power and the platform to be able sure, to do that sure. how do we get there first of all uh, you have to have projects that show other people that things can be done mm -hmm. if everybody stays at the ground level we won't have any stars to look at them it, it, figuratively speaking Indeed. if you turn off the stars yeah well everything comes black so yes. so I, I chose to have a project that hopefully was a uh, um, you know um, one of the stars that show that, you know, 
the sky is not the limit. You yeah. can go in further. Um, so, so creating hope, you have to have, uh, you have to show things. That means walk and talk. Mm-hmm. You have to have the walk also. Talking is easy. You can tell anybody, oh, the sky is the limit. You're so special. Go and do it. Pursue it. But you also have to have a realistic take on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's the thing. Uh, also, I think that hope is the last thing that disappears from a human being. So if you don't have hope, then you're really in, a, in big trouble. Um, hope is also being aware of this, mm-hmm. the sinus curve. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to be aware that adversity is part of life and it's a very important part of life. So that means when you go for your own dreams, then don't expect a paved road without any bumps and you'll have a tailwind all the way. That's not meant to be. If I look back at the things that I cherish the most, that I've accomplished, it's the things that I had to work the hardest to get. And all the very, very successful people that I've been blessed with in, the, in, you know, in sports, and in, in corporate world, in life in general, they have all faced adversity. And, and when you see, like, like you and I, you see, talk to 25 million or how many people are, are watching Mad Talks, it, it's the thing, when, when you hear about successful people, often you see one part of the metal, the shiny part, <laughs> and there's, uh, there's, a, there's a really black part on the other side, and that was a necessity for the shiny part to uh, materialize. And, and I think that's the thing. When, when you look at the people who inspire you, remember that these people also had to go through very tough times. Yeah. Uh, and you should expect the same thing too, and when it happens, you shouldn't be startled by it. You should see, of course, you shouldn't just lie down, but see it as a part of the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, I think, is important to create uh, hope too. And also, that take one step at a time. You, if you come to base camp on Everest and you focus on, focus on the summit for the entire 10 weeks it takes to climb it, mm-hmm. the mountain in your head will have become 20 kilometers higher. Yes. It, it's too hard on the brain. Don't focus on the journey. That's the goal in mm-hmm. itself. And then it will give you the best result. That's also science. Yeah. If you focus on your journey and the process, then you'll get the best results. And I think that's important too when you're looking at hope. One of the other variables which a, a lot of these, um, these great people that I have spoken to uh, talk about is luck. And sure. Luck but more opportunity. And then you're working hard, you get opportunity. Some people call it luck. People yeah. like you and I yeah. just call it like hard work coming yeah, together sure. with opportunity. The harder you work, the luckier you get. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, one of the, those breaks that you got was to be discovered by Discovery Channel, yes. which that, reached half a billion people. And, and the Tell thing us is, about that. Yeah. When we're talking about fate. Do you think people, uh, things happen by chance in life? I don't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, and the thing is, I started out with my um, local newspaper, front page of that, and that's uh, for, de- for, de- for Danish size, Vibor, which is the city that I come from, yeah. it's a medium-sized uh, Danish city. It has 40,000 inhabitants. Yeah. That's a fairly big city in Denmark. <laughs> and, you, and you laugh at it, if you live here, right? Yeah. But, but the thing is, that was the first platform. And then as, as uh, I rolled out the project, then Denmark become a, became a platform mm. uh, because you don't have that many crazy... Uh, climbers. You have a lot of crazy people in Denmark, but not so many crazy climbers, and especially since I was the first in the world ever to transport myself cycling and running from my home country to Everest Base Camp. It created a little attention. I didn't summit in my first attempt, and then I was coming back the year after, and then chance, let's call it that, uh, was that the Russell Bryce, who, who was, had the uh, expedition company, I used his logistics and, and knowledge. He was a big inspiration and, and, and extremely competent. But he had made a deal with Discovery Channel. I believe it's a, it's a, it's a minor uh, American documentary channel. <laughs> no, <laughs> yes. it's, it's rather big, isn't it? Um, and they... Um, six programs, 45 minutes to be sent on global discovery. Mm-hmm. And because of my crazy story, I became one of the main characters. And then I didn't summit that year, so I came back another year. They were coming back too. So in the end, we ended up 12 programs, 45 minutes, global discovery. Mm-hmm. And I believe uh, to this day, it's 10 years since they were mm-hmm. broadcast first, probably half a billion people have watched it. Uh, and I went from 40,000 to half a billion people on Discovery Channel. And, and that just, you know, it, it, I think it's a good metaphor for showing that adventures, when, when you go on an adventure, mm-hmm. when you start, you have no idea what it can uh, amount to, yeah. how it can escalate. It's like the inertia f- from a snowball. When you, when you throw it down a mountain, it'll, it'll pick up more snow and becomes uh, gigantic at the end. And, and, and that's the thing, you, you shouldn't limit yourself too much. That's where the open mind is, is a good idea. 
uh, because just go with the flow and see what happens. Yeah. Uh, and that meant that for 10 years, every week, I receive emails from people around the world who've seen the programs, even now, uh, when they have been rerun for the 20th time. <laughs> yes. um, but, but people have seen the, the programs and, and they've heard my story and they, they something, uh, my blessing, of course, has sunk in with them and they take time to write. Well, you know, the most valuable asset is time, but they take some of their time to write me an email and say, once we saw the program and uh, we were very inspired, thank you very much. And for me, if I look back in the 10 years, uh, 12 years, that, that my crazy project, the biggest compliment that I ever got, and the biggest accomplishment mm -hmm. was was exactly that that I was able to inspire other people. Uh, I don't think you can get a bigger compliment from any journey you do in life. Absolutely, is, is to do good yeah. uh, with other people, yeah. and it, it makes uh, so much sense. It's the same thing when people say when uh, when you're climbing Everest, and what do you do now? Where do you mm -hmm. go from there? And I said, well, I've, I've stepped to the side, and now I'm helping other people. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to help other people, mm -hmm. and say, but hey, that can't be the same. It's not the same, but in many ways, it's it's uh, it's more rewarding to uh, to see other people succeed in their dreams and mm -hmm. that knowing that you've had a little bit of uh, share in, in that journey. Indeed, and that is where humility starts clicking and in. It that is, that yeah. is where you become much, much bigger than yourself sure. uh, and you inspire. One of my other questions is that we spoke about the young people and we have the world of technology and social media and so on. The other group, which are the employers and the older people and so on, what should they be looking for in the young people coming in and, and how to inspire themselves and connect with these people? Well, the thing is that uh, we're living in a world that's changing all the time and you actually, uh, my inspiration in that topic is you because uh, when we did the TEDx uh, together, you, you said that you have a, you have a young mentor. Yes, yes. And, and I think that's, that's an extremely humble uh, thing to do because you've, you've um, realized that Hey, I'm somewhat, uh, I'm 44, you know, so it's a bit more than four, 21, but it's, it's a new world and um, I don't understand it as well as the people living in it. So let me get a mentor in that way. Uh, and I think that that should be, um, normally you would say that when you get older, then you become more of a you know, mentor for others. Yeah. But the thing is to be able to continue being humble and, and learning from, from the younger generations is... It can also help you in, in the visions that you still have uh, and give you a broader perspective. So, so I think that's, that's a wonderful idea. Thank so you. I need to find my own uh, young mentor. Your young mentor? Uh, we are putting a whole reverse mentoring program okay. together. Yeah. And uh, please become our star mentee. Oh, uh, oh. So when we have the younger yeah. people, the 21-year-old will be teaching yeah, yeah. you. Well, feel <laughs> Which, free to contact me. That thank you. Thank you. No, I think that would, be, one, that would be wonderful yeah. because, uh, because I think they need to... Uh, you can inspire younger people because you can just say, listen, you have a contribution to make to me in terms of your vision and your sure. contribution. I think uh, that's a wonderful thing to see. Uh, when you are uh, dealing with CEOs and people who are in the position of employing young people and so on, and you're obviously, while you're doing your health uh, check with them, you're also doing their mental thing. Sure. What are the kind of things you, that, are, that they're scared of? What's their, what are their fears? and as these young people are coming up? Change uh, and uh, the ability to handle change. I think most of the people that I've worked with, they know that they don't have the same, they, they don't, it ha it's not in their genes. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's something they have to learn, it just come natural to them. Uh, and and uh, young people nowadays, they've been living with this uh, constant change all their life. For them, it's a natural thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It does not alarm them to be that they have to change. Uh, whereas uh, the older generation, and my, uh, myself and you will probably relate to it too, you know, change um, stresses us much more than it does the younger generation. <laughs> yes. so, so look at uh, how, how is that? And I believe that one of the things is that, you know, they, they go more with the flow mm. as opposed to being judgmental in everything that yeah. happens, that you have to have a, an opinion on this and that. Uh, they, they just more go with the flow and accept that this is how, it's, how it is. Mm. I think the older generation, we try to fight it more. Whereas they, they just see that as normal, we see it as abnormal mm -hmm. because it doesn't relate to the world we lived in when we were their age. So, so that's, that's one of the things and that's where the reverse mentoring can be very useful, I, I believe, because they can uh, install uh, a different perspective mm -hmm. uh, f to us yeah. um, as opposed to that. And, and the world is changing all the time. And it's actually good. We all remember Charles Darwin's survival of the fittest. Yeah. And, and, Initially, when you think about that, you say it's the strongest that survive, but that's not what Darwin meant. He meant that the ones who are able to adapt yeah. 
will survive. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing. Yeah. That's the thing. Precisely, your ability to adapt and accommodate change. Well, What's the advice that uh, you would give to your uh, young children as they grow up in terms of what they want to do in life? Um, do you want them to be a musician, an artist, a no, sports person, or, or a scientist? Yeah. Uh, as a parent, what are you sure, telling as them? As a parent, I don't care what they become as long as they uh, do something that uh, gives them a great why. Mm -hmm. well, of course, there are limits, you know, but, sure. but I, don't have a, I don't want Storm to become a mountaineer. Yeah. It's, uh, like uh, we know a lot of parents uh, unfulfilled dreams are yes. uh, moved on to next generation i think that's a big mistake i think what really is a big wish is that they uh, they are lucky enough to to meet activities that can ignite their passion and internal motivation and be that uh, you know a doctor or um, taxi driver or whatever yeah. as long as it's something that gives great meaning and, and, and increases their well-being doing, then I'm fine. You gave a lovely example of uh, when you, of a shipbuilder and how and what you train them for. Can sure. you share that with us? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when, when you have your dreams and you have other people uh, working with other people, um, if you, there's, there's an old saying that if you want to build a ship, you shouldn't teach people the art of carpentry. Um, you should awaken the longing for the sea. And, and that too is something I take as a philosophy in the people that I work with is we look at, and that's meaning, you mm -hmm. know, and that's the big why. Uh, because anybody can, can learn how to, how to do, the, not to put anything down about that, but the bigger meaning and the bigger motivation will come from um, the longing for something, yeah. because that's important. Mons, you're, you're a very blessed man and uh, you have a wonderful family. You achieved a lot of peaks in your life. And you've reached what I would call a very, very high inflection point. Now, you can do three things. You can do go down the mountain, the peak. You can stay and cruise because you've done enough to survive. Or take the next one. What's sure. your next peak in your life? The next peak is going to be uh, trying mm -hmm. to help uh, other people um, succeed in, in their line of uh, expertise mm -hmm. or, or dream. Uh, that's the thing for me uh, personally uh, if you want you know uh, superseding cycling and running from Denmark and, and almost climbing Everest on the first it's it was that's that's um, that's something I have to live at the age of 35 that was my absolute summer I couldn't top that right um, yeah. so so it is uh, in other ways it's about helping because you know uh, the psychology of a lot of artists and models and sports people they actually go into deep depression after mm, they've sure. achieved their, their, their pinnacle sure. and and then you need to find your yeah. way back and that's and why it's so important yeah you're yeah forced to, because I can, I can easily relate to that yeah because that is, that is the thing because afterwards I have also different projects but it's mm -hmm. when you when you get to a certain point then you realize that well it, it's still you know it, it, it um, it, it wouldn't match up to, to what you have done. So you have to find other uh, values um, mm -hmm. to, now, to use your passion because your passion doesn't die uh, when, when you reach the summit of Everest. You have to use it for the rest of Indeed. your life. Indeed. Now, let's, do some, let's be playful. Let's do something. I, I'm, sure you're, 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 I'm sure Storm will enjoy that. Imagine we have a big capsule around us, a time capsule, and we're all there, and we're going to be transporting ourselves into the, into the future 50 years from now. It's your 90th birthday, and you're there, and all of us are there to celebrate uh, Mon's life. What are we celebrating? What are we saying he has achieved? He, just, he did the Mount, Mount Everest in 2007. He's done that. Yeah, What's he done in 2047? Sure. Well, first of all, it would be uh, a memory of a, of a person who, who was very passionate and tried to follow the path that his head and heart um, mm -hmm. were telling him to do, that he was true to himself and his values and didn't compromise in, in that regard um, and tried to. He wasn't very focused on what other people wanted him to, to pursue mm -hmm. of, uh, of dreams. He was very true to himself. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the things that would be a great value, it's a hope, the, the fact that he used his experiences um, to, to pass them on to family and uh, friends and of course the people that he worked with. Uh, the thing that um, you should dream big, you should have um, the courage you know, to do so 
uh, but you should also be realistic uh, in that and also the fact that that he didn't try to paint fairy tales he was being a realistic uh, dreamer Mums, i i'm genuinely humbled uh, by this experience i saw you the, the, the other day i am really privileged to connect with you today so, uh, with my heart so. i honestly i feel very very humbled by this uh, you, uh, you're a great role model, you've achieved amazing greatness already and you're still wanting to do more and people can easily cruise. Inshallah. So I feel, inshallah, absolutely. And uh, so I feel inspired. I believe a lot of the people who are watching this will feel, will find something in their, in their whole process. And, uh, and I'm sure you will do wonderful, wonderful things. And I hope your dreams come true because you're fulfilling other people's dreams. So dreams time X, you know, yes, so, yeah. so that's infinity, infinity. Uh, that, that you're creating. Any final advice that you would like to give to the millions of people who will be actually seeing um, this? Yeah, I, th I think gratitude is very important. I think that we should uh, remember that you don't necessarily need the big achievements to, mm -hmm. uh, to feel fulfilled. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should remember that we can find big miracles in s small events. Yeah. So that means uh, open your eyes and, and focus on your journey as opposed to only the result you're aiming for. Because mm -hmm. if you do that for five years, um, you will have missed a lot of small uh, miracles. Yeah. So that's the thing. Focus on the journey and remember that's the real goal. And then the end you will uh, maybe you get 40 minutes on the summit but you spent five years uh, getting there mm -hmm. and the five years is the platform for your learning and you're growing uh, so remember that the small uh, the big miracle and the small things no, deep honor thank you thank you very much indeed i'm uh, honored to be here thank, thank you sir thank you